Thanks for joining us on This Week in Health IT Influence. My name is Bill Russell, former healthcare CIO for 16 Hospital System and creator of This Week in Health IT, a channel dedicated to keeping health IT staff current and engaged. Today, John Brownstein joins us. He's an epidemiologist, Harvard professor, and chief innovation officer for Boston Children's. And we're gonna talk about fighting the pandemic with data and information and just some of the interesting things they have done to get the word out. We've introduced a new podcast on the This Week in Health IT channel, Today in Health IT. This is a place where we recap a news story and we break it down every weekday morning. I'm excited that we're able to take those conversations we're having on LinkedIn and go one step further and really examine the so what of each one of these stories. So please go give us a follow on todayinhealthit.com. You can follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, it's out there. We'd love to have you also join the conversation on LinkedIn. Also share it with your team and continue to partner with us as we propel healthcare forward. Special thanks to our Influence Show sponsors, Sirius Healthcare and Health Lyrics, for choosing to invest in our mission to develop the next generation of health IT leaders. If you want to be a part of our mission, you can become a show sponsor. The first step is to send an email to partner at thisweekinhealthit.com. Today, we are having a conversation with John Brownstein, who is the, he's an epidemiologist, Harvard professor, and chief innovation officer at Boston Children's Hospital. Hey, John, welcome to the show. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks so much. I, I see your Dr. Fauci pillow in the background. Yeah, it's, it's uh, the Fauci on the couch, always looking over me, making sure <laughs> that I'm on the couch. communicating um, public health messaging in the right way. Yeah, so you're, you're, you are an epi epidemiologist, and one of the things, as I was doing research for the show, you do a lot of work with ABC. I mean, you're you're getting the message out. Is that just in the Boston or in the New England area? No, it's it's a it's a national effort, and I, I spend a lot of time. It's been as part of this pandemic, the epidemiologist doing research is is a big part of it, but also science communication and really trying to distill the best of science and message that. And there clearly, up until recently, there's been a bit of a void in sort of articulating the science and, and, and really being as evidence-based as possible and to, to, to get the public engaged in these very you know, challenging times. Yeah, I just did an episode for the Newsday show and we were talking about the vaccine rollout. And I, I I'm personally feel like we're focusing on the wrong things. I think we'll, 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 production will get there. Johnson & Johnson will come out with their new vaccine. We'll have more vaccine than we know what to do with in, in the very near future because there's still like, I, I see different numbers, but it feels like anywhere between 20 and 40% of the population that don't want the vaccine. There's a significant education that still needs to happen to get those people to, to want to get it. Yeah. Is, is that what you're seeing as well? I think that we have not focused nearly enough on communication and education. We have been so hyper-focused on, of course, the development of this vaccine, which clearly is an amazing scientific achievement we should all be proud of. And, and then the secondary focus has been distribution, but we have not nearly focused on the communication. That often gets left behind in public health. And so I think we, we're gonna have a hesitancy issue. We're gonna have people that are not believing the science and people that for good reasons, some to feel like that they shouldn't get this vaccine because of mistrust in the government. And some may be believing some of the things that they read, some of the rumors that sprout. And we need a, we need a whole discipline of, of science and communication that's focused on the, the right messaging around this vaccine to get everyone on board. And I, I just, I don't think we put the resources to match Operation Warp Speed in on communication. Yeah. And uh I'm not going to rehash all the things that you're going to talk about on ABC. If people want, want to see all those things, it's actually pretty interesting. Just type in ABC, John Brownstein, Brownstein in, in uh, Google, and you'll, you'll see a bunch of clips. And you're doing a, a great service to the community. I really want to, I want to focus in on data, fighting the pandemic from a data and information and, and innovation standpoint. So, yeah. But before we get to that topic, tell us about Boston Children's and your, and your role there. Yeah, so I have... I think one of the best jobs out there, I get to be the chief innovation officer of a top pediatric hospital where I focus on 
bringing the sort of the digital journey to a healthcare system and work ranging from working from with startups as an accelerator to working with larger companies and thinking about how the, the future of the practice of medicine digital will 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 be you know so commonplace and that can range from of course innovations on the electronic medical record to telemedicine which we had ramped up right before you know the pandemic remote patient monitoring and then more forward things like how does AI sort of change the, the, the practice of medicine how do we um, think about u- utilizing the data that we have at our fingertips to make better decisions how do we bring in voice and and biomarkers and machine vision and other new areas of tech to, to the forefront and and sort of supplement the clinician reduce their burnout and of course improve patient outcomes through better engagement and an improved experience how, as the chief innovation officer how do you determine this is the age old you know governance and priority standpoint how do you determine what, what areas you're going to focus in on and what solutions get, get mine time. It's the Boston Children's is world-class, but it doesn't have an unlimited budget, right? right? So you have to be very selective. Yeah. I mean, listen, we, we, even in a, we have a small mighty team, we've actually been able to accomplish a lot, but yes, discipline is super important because we can't boil the ocean in all sorts of ideas. We set it, you know, priorities for the year, every year. And, and, and we go off you know, three or four pillars and those pillars for us right now are sort of AI and optimization of, of, of care delivery, their behavioral health, their innovations in primary care, pay, you know, physician burnout. We set sort of priority areas and we, we go after them, uncover where there's opportunities to partner with companies. And when there's gaps, especially when that's pediatrics, we have a team that can help build some of these solutions. So you know, we've, we've, we've had a long series of partnerships from companies like Amazon and Google and Nuance to like spin out companies that we've developed ourselves where we found opportunities. Yeah. So small, mighty team, what does that look like? I mean, we have teams like Providence had 200 people sitting in the downtown Seattle. I, I, I don't think it's that big anymore, but, but it was a pretty big team. You, small, mighty. What does that look well, like? Well, it's grown up. It used to be much more small and mighty. I think we have taken on some of the larger digital health efforts of the hospital, like telemedicine and the patient portal. And so that team has grown to probably more like 60, 70 people, but a lot of it is in sort of the large scale implementations that are required because we have this sort of principle of sort of source launch scale. We have a team that is focused on identifying companies or efforts or new IP that can help solve some of those priorities. And then we launch those efforts and we pilot in different service lines. And then the opera, opera, operationalizing some of these bigger topics requires a larger team, right? How do we, how do we go after, you know, you know, use major nuance deployment that requires a lot of people or how do we stand up telemedicine in a pandemic? That's, there's a lot of people involved in doing that. Absolutely. All right. I, I sort of want to look at the pandemic from a data and information standpoint and and just sort of tap your your expertise in this so the, the the data journey on the pandemic has been what's the best way to say this Un, uneven i guess would be a, the nicest way of saying it that we've had fits and starts and we didn't have information with that so i want to rewind a year and at least at least early on in the pandemic and just talk about what did it look like? What information did we have? What were we missing? And what did we need to fill in pretty quickly in order to start to address some of the challenges that the pandemic would, would deal us? Yeah. I mean, the pandemic has exposed major data gaps when it comes to pandemics from the very uh, initial uh, stages to even today. At the beginning stages, we focus a lot on early detection of outbreaks. So my other hat, other than chief innovation officer, is a, I'm a professor at Harvard Medical School, run a lab that has been focused on public health technologies for, for many years. And so we've been involved in early identification of a range of disease events like H1N1 and Zika. And in this case, we definitely identified at the end of December, something that was going on in Wuhan 
uh, December 30th, we sent the first alert of something unusual happening, but clearly something was brewing for weeks, if not months ahead of that. And we didn't have the right technologies either at a global scale, but probably not at a local scale either to identify that aberration in symptoms or emergency department visits that sort of delayed our ability to, to track this virus. And whether that's because we're limited by access to these kinds of, whether it's individual level data on symptoms or because we don't have the right kinds of diagnostics in place, we are challenged. So we already, out of the gate, we are already delayed. Then from there, like being able to track this virus as it spread around the world, I mean, we built this international network of volunteers that were contributing uh, data from various parts of the globe to, to sort of pull together our, our sort of a global understanding of what was happening with, with COVID. Again, this was a network of volunteers because there was no sort of real global body that was really focused on pulling these data together and giving that sort of global picture. And then of course, when, when the virus hit the shores of the US, you know, we were, we were pretty data blind. We didn't have good uh, surveillance systems around symptoms or cases. Of course, we didn't have the diagnostics. We didn't have understanding. We, we ended up launching uh, a platform called COVID Near You funded by Google, which ultimately allowed us to fully uncover some of the, the, the emergence events of COVID in communities because we had no ability to test. Now, eventually, the systems caught up, more testing. We started getting feeds of hospitalization data, mortality data. Eventually, all those things became more commonplace. And we, but again, like we go to like the Johns Hopkins website or uh, the COVID tracking project or COVID Act Now. Like these are all efforts that were, are de novo and they aren't really government efforts. And there's, so there's a big data gap in what government agencies are providing today in terms of a real-time visibility. We're challenged in this country because of the way that public health is set up. And so it, it makes sense that it's it's hard to give a national picture in real time. I've been, I haven't thought about this. The Johns Hopkins model, what's what's feeding that? Is that CDC data or what, what is feeding that? They are scraping like, you know, what we've done for our health map platform very similarly, like they're scraping public health websites and aggregating that data, right? So they've found different parts of the web that are that are putting up daily data about cases, and they're scraping that information. At the U.S. level, it's not a, it's not a CDC website. They're they're going to like local public health uh, department websites and, and grabbing that data. Wow. All right. So wow, you've given me a lot of places. Let, let's start with COVID near you. So participatory surveillance. Yeah. Talk about what that is and and what the yeah. value of it is. So. Be, because we are limited in widespread testing, and we actually, we're still limited today. I mean, we're not doing nearly enough testing. One of the areas of surveillance that can come, become really handy is the sort of area of syndromic surveillance, understanding symptoms in populations to give you an insight of how bad the epidemic is. And we've been crowdsourcing symptoms for actually many years. We actually were doing it for flu beforehand in a system called Flu Near You. And immediately we recognized that we did not understand how this virus was spreading in communities across the country. We were fully data blind. And so we built this crowdsourcing tool where people can report in their symptoms and get test me text message reminders. And we got millions of people in the system that are telling us a few times a week how they're feeling, getting data about their demographics, their, their, their testing status, and now we'll get data about their vaccination status. So it can give you incredibly granular information at the the demographics level, the behavior levels. I mean, we just published a paper a couple of days ago in Lancet that we could use this data to understand the value of masking in a community because we could see sort of what cases were popping up in a particular location and then look at mask wearing behavior and show that sort of increase in mask wearing behavior led to the ability to the higher probability to control the, the pandemic in that location. Not earth shattering, but even to this day in this pandemic, publishing that paper generated a huge amount of controversy that people still don't believe in masks work. So you'd think at this point, we, we, we'd be sort of over the mask debate uh, that rages on even to, to this date. So you talk about something like COVID near you, it just struck me that, I mean, and we've known this for years, right? So a Google search, 
there's a lot of people that are out there, symptoms, they're searching for this and that and everything else. I mean, Google could probably create just in, in and of their own search data, mm. let alone, uh, you know, an Amazon with purchase and searches and, and purchases for different types of things. They could probably, there's probably enough data out there to, to build some, some type of model that would show what's going on in the country, isn't there? It's just yeah, hard to sure. get all that data together, I would imagine. Exactly. We we actually were part of the team that helped initially build Google Flu Trends and have been working with search query data for a lot of years. Absolutely. It's it's we've always found that it's about integrating various data streams and pulling them together to give the best sort of insight of what's happening on the ground, not relying on one data source, but how do you pull various streams together and create sort of a, a better sort of situational awareness picture. I, I do want to ask you if we're collecting the right information at the point of care. But before I get there, I want to talk about models a little bit because the early on we did this, I, I, I guess we all assumed that this thing would spread like it did in New York and it would spread across the country and we would have sort of this, this massive thing, but that's, that's not what happened. It spread in New York, it spread in New Orleans, uh, Seattle, LA, and, and it, it spread in pockets and then, and then it sort of subsided, then it sort of spread again. I mean, it, it, has, a, it has a weird pattern. Is there a defined pattern? It would be one of my questions. And then the second would be just around building models. Because one of the things is we shut down elective procedures. You know, these hospitals, I just attended the JP Morgan conference and these hospitals have this big donut from, you know, March to, to May in terms of their revenue. And some of it was, was not real warranted. I mean, they were, during that time, some of them only had like five COVID patients, but they, they literally had people sitting around not doing anything. So the models sort of failed us at that point. So I, I guess the question is, uh, you know, is there any pattern and have we, or, or were, were we just guessing early on for the most part? Well, I think, you know, clearly we were, we were caught flat footed. There was, there's, there was this expectation that we weren't going to have the pandemic and there were, there was a lot of mixed messaging. And unfortunately, New York got hit very early on when we didn't have a lot of understanding of this virus. Obviously, New York is a very large city and that there's and densely populated. And there are a lot of you know, sort of demographic factors for why it was sort of a breeding ground for the initial sort of wave, obviously, because there's inbound tra you know, transportation in there as well. And then, of course, we started applying control strategies Part of the issue and, and why it's hard to predict is that we've had very uneven control efforts in different parts of the country. We changed mobility patterns. We did social distancing, mask wearing, but it was uneven. We didn't have sort of a national strategy or there was no national ad, 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 you know, advocacy for a one sort of common approach. So some communities you know, were able to manage things and others weren't. And then of course, pandemic fatigue sets in and people change their behavior and mobility goes up. Uh, gather indoor gatherings go up and you know, that's where, where you see some of the problems arise and of course as temperatures drop and people start to move inside we see those rises again new york city just had you know really bad time because again like that's when we sort of were still living life in this sort of normal way clearly we made a major pivot right after that and got the pandemic in, under control but slowly but surely it started merging itself and especially in parts of the, of the country that were probably more reluctant to make a decision on disease control over the economy. Yeah. So let's talk about data we're collecting at the point of care and the, and it's, uh, it's interesting because that data sort of changed as the pandemic went along and where you were, were going to report it changed and then changed back. So are we collecting the right information even today at the point of care? With regard to, I guess there's a lot of different perspectives, right? Utilization of the health system, utilization of PPE, uh, but also the the spread and, and and those kind of things. Are we are we collecting the right information? Are we collecting too much information? I, what's where? What's the status? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think we uh, have decent visibility on the pandemic now. I think we we miss, you know when you start to aggregate at geographies, you start to miss certain details in terms of race and ethnicity and disparities and, and you know, granular differences that make a difference in this pandemic, right? We know that 
sort of, you know, communities of color have gotten hit much harder, rural communities have gotten hit much harder. So oftentimes the data that gets presented isn't at the level of, of detail or doesn't have the attributes that allows us to fully understand. And we know that, that those kind of data elements are super important. I mean, we know that with, with that kind of knowledge, you can, you can properly intervene or set up testing or improve communications. Of course, now with a vaccine, like how do you target vaccination clinics to the places that need it the most? We're not necessarily using, either we don't have all the attributes or we're not using those attributes in the best possible way to inform the response. So that's been a problem from the beginning. I think it's definitely got better. But, you know, again, we're not the best in as much as we like to talk a big game about using data to drive decisions, whether it's healthcare or public health, I don't think sort of that is necessarily, especially when it comes to real-time response, I don't think we do a good enough job in that space. So I want to talk about public health, but also maybe from this perspective, let's fast forward five years from now, because we're still in the middle. I don't know if we're in the middle, but we're still smack dab in the in the, in the pandemic and, and getting to the other side of it but five years from now what would it what will it look like if we take these lessons and apply them well and you can talk about any any of the different areas in terms of surveillance in terms of public health or that kind of stuff what will it look like in five years if, if we learn the right lessons yeah well listen i think that there we have to do a better job of investing in the public health workforce. Clearly, we have seen major gaps in sort of, of talent and people that can respond, that public health departments are severely underfunded and resor- under-resourced. I mean, we're expecting public health departments right now to maintain surveillance and efforts, but while at the same time now roll out a vaccine, it, it's, it just doesn't work well. I mean, I, we, I understand the need to have distributed and local-based public health, but at this level of distributed effort, it creates so much dysfunction and unevenness of, of resourcing in terms of public health. So hopefully some of the, the new support that's coming at the federal level will help to even the playing field. I think that, of course, we need to strengthen our ability to respond to, to global threats. Over, over the last several years, we've had significant underfunding of, of efforts. I was part of a project funded by USAID to look for novel coronaviruses in populations. And that project was defunded last summer. So bad timing to defund a novel coronavirus surveillance project right before a pandemic, but that happened. And so hopefully some of these larger efforts that are involved in sort of field-based surveillance to identify new viruses or efforts that are about strengthening global public health surveillance. And then I think at at a, a federal level, there's this hope and a push right now to invest in sort of a national disease forecasting center, which applies some of the principles from weather where you're tra- you know, you, where you're both now casting, but also forecasting. And in this case, it would be diseases. How, what is, you know, the outlook and how do we bring the discipline of disease surveillance and modeling and bring that to a federal level where we, we have full visibility on what is happening across the wide spectrum of pathogens. I mean, the likelihood that we're going to see another pandemic is significant. Who knows what the timing will be for that, but hopefully core sort of underlying resources will come to sort of make sure that we are ready. And then again, and the last thing I'll just mention is diagnostics. We have not done a good enough job to fund and develop at home rapid connected diagnostics that can give us that quick view of what's happening at a population level. Those are things that we should have been implementing years ago. And I think there's, there's real technology that, that could be put out. It's, it's, it, education is always a silver bullet in a lot of this. And we talked about that earlier, how important education is. Do, do you see, I mean, as a result of the pandemic, so many things are gonna change, how we approach our doctors and how we look at tele, I mean, telehealth has is, is fundamentally changed forever. I don't think we're going back work from home, or the nature of work, commercial real estate, the makeup of hospitals. And I mean, there's a lot of things that are probably changed forever. Education, do you think we will start to introduce different things, maybe even as, as early on as in grade school, so that when we're having conversations about 
we say, well, we're having conversations about science, but the reality is a significant number of people don't have a chemistry and a biology background or definitely an epidemiology background. And so they rely on the, their sources of information for to get to get that. What kind of things can we put into a, into a, an education program to make the next generation just more aware of, of what's facing them? Yeah, I mean, I think that basic health education is something that isn't part of generally, I mean, obviously, there's components of of understanding biology that come into early education, but then we don't really talk about human health and risk factors, and we don't talk about, of course, emerging infectious diseases, but also chronic diseases and sort of the general population level impacts of, of, of major of major illnesses and populations, there's there's room for that, I would say. But you know, of course, I'm an epidemiologist, so I would say I would definitely say that. And but there's a high, there's a lot of focus on climate change, and that's a great opportunity to talk about the intersection of human health and climate. So yeah, I think it's amazing to me right now as an epidemiologist, numbers of people that have understand basic epidemiological concepts. At least, I mean, some clearly don't fully grasp them, but you know, have friends and colleagues talk about our nod and understanding mortality and infection rates and case fatality rate. So it's amazing that some of these basic epi concepts are now mainstream. So I, I would love to see some of these things be sort of become mainstream. And the first time I got any education around epidemiology and public health was because I forced my way into a grad school class while I was an undergrad. Otherwise, you'd have no access to this kind of knowledge till well after your undergraduate education. How, how has the pandemic shaped what you're doing at Boston Children's? Yeah, I think it's permanently changed how we think about digital, which is great because we've been preparing it for this for a long time, but we went from having a, a, a very small sort of telemedicine program to like being at one point doing the bulk of our visits virtually. And now we're in a steady state, with, which still a lot of visits are being done virtually. And what, lo and behold, our physicians loved it, patients loved it, satisfaction through the roof, saved people trips. So I think you know that again that has changed our ability to, to deliver care in ways that, again, in some ways we expected, but we never thought it'd be this dramatic. It's forced us to think about how we we get content we get check-ins from 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 patients it's it's accelerated our pace in, in remote patient monitoring it's 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 made everyone aware of that digital is not sort of this like lesser experience or sort of a dumbed down version of the of the in person it's it's an augmentation and so it it's 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 been really transformational. I mean, obviously we focus so much more on the patient portal and, and text-based communications and all sorts of things. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been incredibly meaningful to our sort of trajectory. I think where we always expected we'd go, it just shortened that timeline. So talk, talk to me a little bit about your work with, with ABC. How did that come about, I guess, and your health system must prioritize it. And we've been, actually, when I was the CIO, I, we, we, we talked a lot about this, uh, developing this new muscle of interacting with the community at a different level. Uh, we started putting doctors in the grocery stores and the doctors were there for consultation because most, a lot of bad health decisions are made in that grocery store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So having, having a doctor there was, was a pretty, it wasn't my idea, it was somebody else's idea. And I, I loved it though, because it was interesting because they, we, we thought, you know, who's going to ask them a question? Well, it turns out they were fairly busy. Yeah, people yeah. people had, had a lot of questions. So, so clearly you guys have prioritized this. How did it come about and, and, and how's, how's it going? Yeah, I mean, I, we did some segments early on in the pandemic. I mean, I've always been a big proponent of translating knowledge to, to broader media. I mean, I publish a lot in paper and journals that colleagues will read, but nobody, they don't get the same sort of visibility. You know, the, the sort of the direct impact is incremental. You don't get to, f I always thought that getting visibility on some of the research can have a bigger impact. And so, you know, I'd done some initial work with ABC, actually my sister 
I was on Good Morning America. And so I had some connections there. And so, you know, it, it sort of grew from there. And I have done did some live clips and then it's just been sort of a, a constant sort of channel. And I think for me, it's been a good sort of growth area because I've learned to sort of communicate in different ways. And of course, doing live televisions, it just, yeah, as you said, is totally different muscle. But it's, I think it's, 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 it's been helpful. And I think it, it plays a role that I think a lot of my colleagues have also played. I mean, I think I, I can't turn on, the, on CNN or MSNBC without seeing someone I know talking about the pandemic. So I think there's been a lot of people that have sort of been called in and have been willing to help and help explain sort of complicated areas of, of epidemiology and reinforce science and, and also be willing to say, we just don't know yet and there's still not enough data and not be necessarily be so sure of ourselves when the data isn't clear. And, but, you know, of course my hope is now we have a lot of new sort of people in the administration that are, are going to talk about, they're going to, they're going to be able to be put out in front to talk about science. So maybe the roles of some of the academics and hospital people may not be as, as needed, but, you know, I think it, I think it's good to have all these perspectives and people that have like some, some background or education to be able to, to have those platforms to talk, talk it through the American people. Any, any stories come out of it or any major learnings as you're doing live television? I, I, I would imagine at some point you mess up. I don't know. Oh, for sure. I mean, I'm hypercritical of myself. Like I've definitely, oh, unfortunately I did have one situation where, where my, my, the internet kicked out in the middle of, of a live show. And that was, that was pretty traumatizing where like, oh, holy crap, in the middle of a live te- uh, segment, you know. I lose. So I've been very cautious about my internet speed right before. And there's things, things, tech stuff that goes wrong. And that's, that's, that's challenging. In the world of doing this all via Zoom, that's not the normal way someone would do television is from your office, but yeah, you got to roll with the punches. So we had, we had Daniel Nigren on the show during the COVID series. And we talked about what they were doing, but he has since moved on. Yeah. So so you are you are the only CIO there. In no, Asia. no, we have we we have an interim CIO. We also have other CIO, which is the chief investment officer. So we have other CIOs. <laughs> you never have enough CIOs. Yeah, wow. you always you always add more CIOs. Yeah, no, Dan was great. He was a long term partner of mine. We worked really closely together. I pushed him hard to go fast. He explained to me some of the reasons why my expectations were. Uh, were too grand. And I think we, we've, we've met each other in the middle and we had a, gr- a great time. So I, I learned a lot from him. I definitely miss him. He's on to Maine Medical Center doing some great things there. Yeah. You, you described that tension that exists. I know that I, I was lucky enough to have the innovation and information officer, oh. but I, I had team members under me that were in the innovation group and team members that were in the operational side. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I had to have the conversation you just described. I had to have in my own head with <laughs> you, can, you can only move so fast on certain things because there's operational realities, there's training, there's, exactly. uh, there's technology and stuff. But John, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I know. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. What a great discussion. If you know of someone that might benefit from our channel, from these kinds of discussions, please forward them a note perhaps your team, your staff. I know if I were a CIO today, I would have every one of my team members listening to this show. It's it's conference level value every week. They can subscribe on our website, thisweekhealth.com, or they can go wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Google, Overcast, which is what I use, uh, Spotify, Stitcher, you name it, we're out there, they can find us. Go ahead, subscribe today, send a note to someone and have them subscribe as well. We want to thank our channel sponsors who are investing in our mission to develop the next generation of health IT leaders. Those are VMware, Hillrom, Starbridge Advisors, Aruba, and McAfee. Thanks for listening. That's all for now.